Welcome to Geologia da Terra, or Geology of the Earth. I am Fabiana Richter. Alright, so today's episode is kind of a continuation on our last episode, which was about the behavior of fluid flows. In this episode here, we will focus on the behavior of the particles within those fluid flows. So we'll talk about the forces acting on the particles, the Bernoulli effect, the critical velocity for flow entrainment, and the Stokes law and terminal fall velocity of the particles. Particles may be moved in a fluid by one of three mechanisms. The first one is traction, when the clusters move by rolling or sliding along at the bottom of the air or water flow without losing contact with the bed surface. The second one is saltation, when the particles move in a series of jumps, so in each jump they leave the bed surface periodically and are carried for a short distance within the fluid before returning to the bed surface again. The third mechanism is suspension, when turbulence within the flow produces enough upward motion to keep the suspended particles moving within the fluid more or less continually. Particles being moved by traction and saltation are referred to as bed load, that is, they move very close to the bed. And particles moving by suspension are referred to as suspended load, which are carried higher up in the main flow. In fluids with low current velocities and water, only fine particles and low-density particles are kept in suspension, while sand size or larger particles may move by rolling or saltation. But if the flow rates increase, all silt and some sand may become suspended load, while granules and pebbles may be moved by saltation and rolling. But what forces exactly make grains roll, slide, sautate, or get into suspension in a fluid? Well, for a particle to move, the forces generated by fluid flow have to overcome the forces that cause resistance to movement. A force caused by gravity acts downward and causes the particles to resist motion and remain in a bed. Resistance is aided by frictional resistance between particles. So the fluid flow has to generate motive forces to overcome resistance that includes a drag force and a lift force. The drag force depends upon the boundary shear stress and has a drag component that is parallel to flow. Grains move by rolling or sliding as a result of frictional drag between the flow and the clusters, represented by this drag component. But to move particles by saltation or suspension, an initial lift force is required. This lift force is provided by the Bernoulli effect. The best way to understand the Bernoulli effect is to think of a fluid flowing in a tube that is narrower at one end than the other, so the cross-sectional area of the tube is smaller at the narrower end than at the wider end. So let's name the large cross-section 1 and the small one 2. We can transfer these principles to a flow along a channel, where a class at the bottom of the channel will reduce the cross-section of the flow over it. But going back to the tubes example, the thing we want to do is to maintain a constant transport of the fluid through this tube, which means that we want the same mass to pass through the cross-sectional areas 1 and 2 at any given time. So mass 1 has to be equal to mass 2, and we can write this as density times the velocity times the area 1 has to be equal to the density times the velocity times the area 2. But the density of the fluid remains constant, so the velocity times the area 1 has to be equal to the velocity times the area 2. But we know that area 1 is greater than area 2, so in order for us to maintain a constant transport of mass, we have to have a higher velocity through area 2 than through area 1. Now, we have to consider not only the conservation of mass, but also the conservation of energy, which can be presented in the form of the Bernoulli equation. So here, the total energy that has to be conserved is equal to the potential energy plus half of the kinetic energy plus the pressure energy. So here, this total energy has to be conserved in the flow from 1 to 2, and remember, we are assuming no energy loss due to frictional effects. So here, the potential energy is constant, because the difference in level H at 1 and 2 is considered to be very small in this case. 
Now, the kinetic energy, however, is changed, as we concluded before because velocity will increase from 1 to 2, and so will the kinetic energy. Therefore, for us to conserve the total energy, the pressure energy needs to decrease from 1 to 2. Thus, the pressure at 2 will be smaller. This means that above the class, the velocity will have to increase to maintain a constant transport, which means that the pressure will decrease in the zone due to the Bernoulli effect. This decrease in pressure provides a temporary hydraulic lift force that moves the clast towards the slow pressure zone from the bottom of the flow. The clast will then be entrained in the moving fluid before falling back down under gravity. But for this to happen, the flow has to achieve a critical velocity. And the critical velocity is the fluid velocity needed for a particle of a certain size to be entrained in the flow. We would expect a simple relationship between the critical velocity and the mass of the particle, because the critical velocity will control the drag and lift forces and those will increase with particle mass. A simple and linear relationship between critical velocity and mass can be applied to sand and gravel, but things are more complicated when finer grain sizes are involved. The relationship between water flow velocity and movement of particles of different grain sizes can be visualized using the experimental Hjustrom diagram. Probably not pronounced this way, but anyways. But this diagram has been superseded by the Shields diagram in 1977, but it is still useful for understanding sediment movement in currents. Here the x-axis is the grain size in millimeters, and on the top part of the diagram we have the grain size name. The y-axis is the flow velocity in centimeters per second. Note that both axes are shown as a base 10 logarithmic scale. The lower line shows the relationship between flow velocity and movement of particles that are already in motion. Above the line there will be transport and below there will be deposition. For instance, one granule will come to rest at a flow velocity of below around 10 cm per second. A medium sand at around 2 to 3 cm per second. And mud, represented by silt and clay, will come to rest at velocities below 0.4 cm per second, which is very close to zero or standing water. Now the upper line shows the velocity needed to move a particle from rest. Note that at any given grain size, the velocity to keep the particle moving is lower than the velocity needed to initiate the movement. Now another important feature of this diagram is that on the right-hand side of the graph, for particles larger than fine sand, the erosion and the position lines parallel each other meaning that erosion and transport of particles of increased grain sizes require an increase in flow velocity. However, this rule does not apply for the finer particles, as shown on the left-hand side of the diagram. Counterintuitively, finer particles than very fine sand need high flow velocities to be eroded and transported. This occurs because clay minerals are highly cohesive and usually dominate the fine fraction in the sediment. So they will stick together both as unconsolidated or as consolidated mud, making it difficult for the particles to be entrained in the flow. Now, for us to determine the settling velocities of the particles, we have to consider the size of the particle, the difference in the density between the particle and the fluid, the fluid viscosity, and the acceleration of the particle due to gravity. The terminal fall velocity will be achieved when the downward movement stops accelerating and the particle begins to fall at a constant velocity. This occurs when the viscous resistance force and the buoyancy force become equal to the weight force due to gravity. And then this terminal fall velocity is given by the relationship known as the Stokes law of settling. But we have to remember that this is only valid for spherical particles in laminar flows. To make things less complex, we can simplify this relationship by considering C as a constant, equal to the right-hand side of this uh, relation. So then we have that the velocity is equal to this constant times the diameter of the grain square. This means that the course of the particle, the higher its terminal settling velocity. For instance, let's imagine a standing body of water or a flow that is decreasing in velocity. 
If we have sediments that are falling out of suspension, initially coarser sand will be deposited, then medium sand, then fine sand, then mud-sized particles. This will generate within one bed what we call normal grading, showing a reduction in grain size from coarse at the bottom to fine at the top, because the coarser particles will have higher fall velocities than the finer ones. Alright, so this is it for today. Today we've discussed the behavior of particles within fluid flows and this will be important for us to interpret sedimentary structures. Thanks for watching. Please leave your comments and like. And if you enjoyed your time at Geology of the Earth, like and subscribe.